First of all, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And I think that you should put this entire endeavor under the patronage of our lady. So we shall do that. And ask his blessings on the speaker and the hearers so that we may love her more and do whatever he tells us. Whatever our Lord tells us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary. Hello, Grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, I would like to welcome you tonight. I'm Sister Elizabeth Mann. I'm Vice President for Academics here. And uh, Sister Mary Sarah couldn't be here tonight, but she said for me to please thank you all for supporting the lecture series. This is our first for the fall. Uh, the next one is on the 25th of October. It's at St. Cecilia's Auditorium. Um, Dr. Mary Connick will speak to us on smart discipline. So um, we hope you're able to join us for that too. There should be a brochure in your packet for, with all the information about all of the um, upcoming lectures and lecture series. Um, maybe some of you have not been to a Aquinas tomorrow, though I see a lot of familiar faces. I see a lot of familiar outfits too, so I know you know. <laughs> um, Aquinas is the only Catholic college in the Diocese of Nashville and as well as the Diocese of Knoxville, so there's one more in Memphis. And we have um, four academic programs here, Arts and Sciences, Business, Education, and Nursing. We just opened a residential program. I think some, I saw some of our resident students here tonight, so they can tell you how that's going. Um, they're our very first, and they're a prime group. We started with about 12, which is the same number Jesus started with, so I think we're ready to come. We also began um, this year graduate programs in education and in nursing education. So please keep those in your prayers. They're off to a good start. Um, and we do want to prepare those professionals who will seek and do the will of God. That's the whole point. So we ask your prayers for God's blessings on that too. It's my privilege to introduce um, Brother Ignatius Perkins, who is the Dean of Nursing here at Aquinas. He will introduce that. Thank you, Sister Ms. Van. Dr. Yudi said to be short and point, then sit down, which I'll do that, but I have several chapters in which to. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great privilege and an opportunity to, to welcome Dr. Lee to Aquinas College again. We come up very often. So as a colleague uh, and a health care clinician, we certainly are very privileged to have you here. Dr. Ely is a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine with a subspecialty training in pulmonary and critical care medicine. He has a particular passion for care of older critical ill patients. His research has focused on improving the care and outcomes of critically ill patients with sepsis and respiratory failure with special emphasis on the problems facing older patients in intensive care units. A devout Catholic, Dr. Ely has contributed inspirational articles to numerous publications, including the Tennessee <coughs> Register. Just last month, he addressed more than 600 healthcare professionals attending the annual meeting of the Catholic Medical Association of St. Paul on the topic of care at the end of life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ely. I'm pretty proud of him. That was nice and short. Thank you, brother. I'm also thankful that my wife and children are here. My wife Kim and Brooke and Blair are here. And my other daughter Taylor, I spoke with this afternoon in London, where she is going to college as a freshman. And it's a real privilege for me to come to Aquinas tonight to share with you this story that I've tried to create, which I do with a lot of trepidation, because 
if you don't think it's humbling to get into a room with a bunch of Dominican sisters and give a talk on Mary, then you haven't thought through this. Um, so I see a lot of familiar faces here and friends, and I also see some people who were with us a couple of weeks ago when we did the Great Divorce play at Innsworth down the street. We had a, a one-act play of C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, and it's just a lot of fun in a, in a community like Nashville to have people who gather together to kind of rally each other in our faith. We're all walking through the same things every day, struggling with sin, struggling with inefficiencies on our own part, the knowledge that we keep falling down despite the fact that we want to do better, and every day just getting back down on our knees, asking God if we can not make that 100,000th error that was similar to the one we just confessed in penance recently. And it's really with that in mind that I bring this talk to you tonight. It's about, well, it's based upon this book. And I'm going to tell you the story of this book and how I came to learn about this book and why I read it. And then the talk is going to be a synthesis of what I did over the last five years, having read the book, to kind of put it together in my mind about Mary. And I'll tell you that it was a long journey for me. And there is no question in my mind that many people in this room are way beyond where I am in my faith with regard to Mary. So the first thing I want to do is apologize to anybody in the room who this ends up not being that edifying for. Uh, and I'm serious about that. But I think that even if you are much further in your devotion, that it will be perhaps interesting to you to look back to maybe where you were when you know, uh, when you see where I am. And as immature as my faith is on my own journey. I will never ever forget the begin reading the beginning of Seawald's interview, book-long interview with Ratzinger, Salt of the Earth, that some of you have read. And in that book, Seawald, an atheist, an agnostic atheist, he, he doesn't know which, says to Ratzinger, who was not then the Pope, how many paths are there to God? And he says, you know, not being a person of faith, I thought he could answer that many ways. Uh, but one, uh, two, you know, he might have said something like that, but he said as many paths as there are human beings. And it's such a brilliant answer. By the way, for anybody who has not read that book, the future pope gave him two rules in this book book interview. He said, yes, see, while you can interview me, I cannot see the questions in advance, and I can bring no notes. And the book is that long. That's a, that's a genius. And that was, those were his rules in establishing that book-long interview. So we have the spectrum of intelligence. We have a spectrum of faith. We have the spectrum of where we are on those, on those infinitely high number of journeys. And all of us in this room bring that to the table tonight. So with that having been said, I'll start trying to do my best with the blessings of, the, of, of Mother Mary and Jesus in unfolding for you the way I have put together what this book, which was the probably the singular most important reason why he was sainted, <clears throat> uh, and why it became the most important thing that JP2 said happened in his entire life with regard to Mary and his Marian devotion, was his finding this book. So I apologize in advance for one other thing, which is that I'm going to have to lay out some math for you, some text, you're going to have to read a little bit, and we're going to work through that. Uh, in, a, in about 40 slides. Um, I, I will do it the, the, as fast as I can, but there is, uh, there's a process to this unveiling of the story. So, first, uh, let me say that uh, how this talk came to be. It first started by me watching my wife and her praying her rosary. And I say that with all seriousness. She has a very large closet that holds a lot of shoes. <laughs> and uh, she goes in there in the morning and says this rosary and comes out and she kind of bats a, hundred, a thousand. And it's really neat to watch her devotion to Mary, especially during the time of our marriage. We've been married for 24 years. I uh, just got back from South Africa celebrating our 24th anniversary. At a time when I did not have that same understanding or that faith in Mary. And I was confused about what the role should be for Mary in my following Jesus. Then what happened was that Maddie, my cab driver, because I teach a lot, so I end up on airplanes uh, quite often, 
Maddie came to me all the time, and, and she would pick me up and take me to the airport. And on the way to the airport, we would talk about faith and, and things that were going on in our lives. And one time, I was reading her a reading, and it had to do with Mary, and she was just all over me about Mary and Catholics and why we pray to Mary, etc. Et and we'll come back to that in a minute. But it really challenged me, and I didn't know how to respond because I was very poorly catechized in the 70s. And then uh, a second thing happened. My daughters go to a Christian, non-denominational Christian camp each summer down in Mentone, Alabama, which is on Lookout Mountain. And there's some wonderful people down there, including this person I'm about to tell you the story about. She didn't know, she didn't understand this, but she, they went on a mission trip to Russia. And she and all of her churchgoers from whatever denomination they were went on this mission trip and came back and I said, how'd it go? Because I, I go down there to become the camp doctor for a couple of weeks when, they, when they're down there at camp. And she said, oh, it was incredible. We had uh, nearly 100 conversions. Wow, how'd you, how'd you know that? She goes, well, uh, 100 conversions, because there were 100 of the kids that we went in there, they started out, they were praying in their Catholic churches mm -hmm. to these saints and to Mary, and, uh, and we were able to get them to confess their love of Christ by the time they left. You know, where is the disconnect on all of this? And that gets back to the reason I'm here giving this talk. So then I watched Kim Moore, and then JP too taught me through this book. And that's really the genesis behind this. By the way, when I was a boy, I was born in Venezuela, and my mother was was Catholic. My her mother her mother was Catholic, and her father was Jewish. So there was a tension there between Ju the Judeo-Christian culture within my mom's family, and then my mom married my dad, who was a Baptist. Um, so I think they were deliberating about how to raise us, but then my dad decided that he didn't want any part of that family anyway, so he bailed, and he left when I was a baby, and my mom had uh, my son, my, my brother, my son, that would be a good one. We'll get to that later on in the talk. And uh, my brother and I were born, and my mom didn't know it, but she was pregnant with my sister. So uh, my father asked, it's okay, Dad, uh, he's dead now, but uh, he'll be hearing this and get me back later, but he asked her to have an abortion. And uh, she chose not to do that, of course, and my sister and brother and I are very happy as siblings now. Uh, anyway, when we got back to Louisiana from Venezuela, I went to Catholic school. And so you'd think that maybe somehow in there I would have gotten a knowledge base about what I'm about to share with you tonight, but I didn't. And uh, I wish that I had, because I would have been happier in my life if I had understood how much better I could get to Jesus through Mary earlier in my life. But anyway, that's kind of how that went down. And, oh, sorry. Oh, this thing has a, uh, a delay on it. So I mentioned to you that Kim and I went to South Africa recently, and we were in an elevator going up to the top of the hotel, and they were building this huge maze outside in this large hotel. And this... British woman said to us, I, I think they plan to build a proper maze. And we thought it was so funny her use of the word proper, but it was true. And if you look at these sort of human life-size mazes, when she said that, and I didn't tell Kim this, but all these things happened in my head, and I thought it would be maybe useful as an intro slide here. So she said, I think they're building a proper maze. And I was, I kind of thought, life maze, difficult to find where you're going, Jabez prayer, dear Lord Jesus, bless me indeed, that means give me presents, um, expand my territory, help me use those presents for you better, hold my hand because I'm likely to make some big mistakes along the way, and deliver me from evil that I may cause no pain. Uh, I thought about that, so I thought about the presents under the tree, and I thought, find the tree. What are the presents? Christ. Christ is the big present under the tree. We've got to find him, get connected to him. How do we do that in Mary? She will tether the distance. So remember that phrase, tether the distance. And I'm going to come back to that as we move along. Let me ask you a question. And there will be a little bit of audience participation here tonight. Who was the first Christian? Mary. Okay, right. Mary was uh, written about. JP2 wrote, I was greatly helped by a book by St. Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort. That's this book. The Treatise of the True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin. There I found the answers to my questions. He was asking, turned out, similar questions to those that I asked and similar to those that many of you probably ask. Yes, Mary does bring us closer to Christ. She does lead us to him, provided that we live her mystery in Christ. And so, 
Thanks to St. Louis, I began to discover the immense riches of Marian devotion from new perspectives. That is precisely what happened to me through reading the book, too. So this is the book that I got when I bought it. It was on a list of rare books. It turns out you can get it all over the place, but I actually had a hard time at the beginning finding it. It's a very popular book now. It's on Amazon.com, so feel free to go grab it. But the history of the book is fascinating. Check this out. In 1673, he was born. In 1700, he gets ordained a priest. In 1716, he dies at the, age, the, the young age of 43, Louis de Montfort. He was only a priest for 16 years. He wrote this book in his own pen, and then the French Revolution happened, and they hid the books. All the, mon the monastic books were hidden under dust. And then a priest found this book in an area called miscellaneous books. He turned out this priest who found it was going to give a, a sermon on Mary. And he happened to find this book, kind of like talk about the Holy Grail. <laughs> and, uh, and when he did, he didn't know what it was about, but it was in original penmanship. And so he took it to the superior, and the superior knew the penmanship and attested that it was Louis de Montfort. And so, in so doing, they sent this book to the Vatican, where it was studied for many years, and it was eventually declared to be inerrant, without error. And then eventually Louis was claimed a saint. So this thing sat under dust for nearly 150 years after it was buried there from the revolution. Thank goodness it was preserved, but eventually came into our hands. Now if you think about Mary, let's go do a little history. St. Anne was the daughter of Stolen and Emerentina, and a mother of the Blessed Virgin was married to Joachim. St. Anne was. Some people say Joachim, some people say Joachim. Sister Mary Diana told me to say Joachim, so that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Proverbs 31, 10, 12 says, When one finds a worthy wife, think of Joachim and Anne, her value is far beyond pearls. Her husband, entrusting his heart to her, has an unfailing prize. I see you smiling. Front row. <laughs> Kim is smiling because I, told, I shared this with her one day. I said to her, Kim, uh, you know, when one finds a worthy wife, her value is far beyond pearls. And she wrote back to me, that, does, that is not to say that a wife does not find value in the pearls. <laughs> so, I remember that whenever I look at this. But anyway, Anne was barren for 20 years until the Immaculate Conception, a thing at the time historically of great embarrassment to the family. But when she was found to be pregnant with Mary, of course, everything began to change. At the Annunciation, Heather King, who's now a lay mystic writer and is featured oftentimes in the Magnificat writes about the Annunciation, I could feel it then. The silence between them, the way everything hinged on Gabriel's earth-shattering question. Whether Mary, a poor, uneducated virgin, would consent to bear the Son of God. The whole cosmos must have stood still. Even the trees and stars holding their breath, waiting for her to reply. And then she had said it. She had said it, be it done unto me according to thy word. Not man's word, but the word of God. Not a life free of suffering. She's taking on something that's an extreme challenge, and she probably senses that, because no such life exists. But a life in which suffering is freely accepted as part of an ongoing creation we are not given to understand fully. Beautiful description by Heather King of what went on in the Annunciation. And of course, during our time to say the rosary, we should picture these moments and imagine them in real time and try and leave behind any assumptions of what we got from, uh, from just picture books and let it create uh, and become alive in our mind. One of the most beautiful things about Mary is found in the comma, of course. The comma in this beautiful blessing, which you see highlighted down there, Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has looked upon the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Not a brag, as she says, comma, for the Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. That comma changes the entire context of the statement. It makes you realize that she pauses, she says, not on my own merit, but only on the merit of God and his plan. So, Raymond Brown, my favorite exegesis, who was at the Biblicum in Rome and writes incredibly gorgeous books explaining the biblical text, says, thus Mary was the first 
disciple of Christ. And she reacted in the same way that we are asked to react. Now bear in mind, and this is where we have to get this straight, she didn't sign up for anything that we have not been asked to sign up for. We have been asked to sign up for the same thing, to carry Jesus' cross every day in our lives, regardless of how difficult it gets. And St. Teresa of Avila says that the heroic virtues are to accept those crosses immediately, without hesitation, regardless of difficulty, consistently, over and over and over again in our lives. So it means that regardless of what happens in your life, no matter how crazy you think it is, how unworthy, uh, how unjust it was, etc., you're asked to sign on to the immediate and glad, gladful, joyous acceptance of that, just like Mary did when she saw her son bleed out tied uh, to a tree. Father John Toller says, Poor, clean, interior, godlike, more a creature of heaven than of earth was Mary. Between her soul and God, there was union without medium. So again, you think, okay, that's Mary, union without medium. The seven mansions, if you read Interior Castle, if you get down to the seventh mansion, she says, St. Teresa of Avila, it's rain on water. Meaning, imagine yourself in a thunderstorm and rain is pouring down on a pond. Pouring down on a pond so much that you can't see two feet in front of you, the rain is coming that hard. Where does the water separate from that pond at that point? You can't see that separation. That's what Teresa of Avila says is our goal. That's where we're supposed to be in our union with Christ and God. And Mary did that, but we're asked to do the same thing. So eventually when I get to the math of this book, you'll see how it's laid out by Louis de Montfort. So, who was the first Christian? Of course, Christian tradition asks us to imagine her experience on his road to Calvary and his holy visit to her on Easter Sunday. Now think about that for a second. We're supposed to imagine her experience seeing him walk by, blood pouring out from the crown of thorns, his sides ripped up from the lashes, all of the spit all over his face, ongoing, and she's watching this happen to her son, and then, in other decades of the rosary, to contrast that reality with him visiting her after he rose from the dead. Not chronicled in a Bible, but you know it happened. There's no question. And how much more beautiful can that be that that was his first visitor, <laughs> the first person he went to, in the secrecy of that little hut or whatever she was in. Just try and get your head around that. And then know that he comes and visits you the same way if you beckon. So, no distinction. Rain on water. Rain on pond. And you can grab that. That's what we have to try and grab. So another question. What are the first words of Mary to Jesus found in the New Testament? It's a real great mystery in this. And for every parent in the room who's asked your kid why... Let's talk about it. Son, why have you behaved like that with us? She found him in the temple. First words of her to him in the Bible. Sees in the temple. Son, why? It's like me asking my daughters, why in the heck would you do that? But the difference is her confidence. Now watch. She has suffered in worry just as we do daily. Yet her cry of why was precisely from her belief in him, not from doubt. And that's a place we all need to get with one another. Jesus' answer was the affirmation of the Father, Father's plan for salvation. The same plan that she signed up for and that we have signed up for too in our confirmation. Even though I said I wasn't poorly catechized, I will never ever forget the night of my confirmation. I had goosebumps all over my body when I got that confirmation. And I didn't even know what was going on. It was extremely confusing to me. I mean, I was like, what is it? It was kind of embarrassing, and I knew people around me might see those goosebumps, and I still don't know today what that was really all about, but it was a life-changing experience, and I'm sure one that I will forever be thankful for, and one which many people might not have had at their confirmation, but that, that was uh, something that happened to me, which I, I'm very thankful for. Uh, now, this is also something fascinating that I never really thought about before, but Mary was chosen by her son. It's a flip. The parent was chosen by the kid. 
such an interesting thing. JP2 points this out, puts it well, that she was chosen before the dawn of time, not only by the father, but also by her son. And we always hear, you know, you can't choose your parents, <coughs> but Jesus did. Pretty neat thing that, uh, that you realize. Now, this is a picture that I took myself in Zaragoza, Spain. I was there for the Spanish Critical Care Society meeting a couple of years ago. And after my talk, I went, found this church, and I saw this statue. Now, you see, what's the big thing you see in the picture? Mary. Mary. All right. Where's Jesus? <clears throat> Little bitty cross below Mary. Mm -hmm. see, her, see him way down there at the bottom? Mm -hmm. You can barely see this cross down here. Down there at the bottom. And to me, I looked at this and I said, I'm going to take that picture and I'm going to use that to explain where I came from regarding my, my misunderstanding of this. This is, I think, where the big confusion comes in the Protestant world, especially as regards they look in on the Catholics, and also within the Catholic world for people who don't understand the role of Mary, which we're getting to, which I haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> but look at this. I mean, she's like blown out mm -hmm. to the nth degree bigger than the cross. And I really do understand why that's confusing to people. And I think that that's an important thing. And we all should become people who understand how to explain this to other people who think that Christ is the big deal, then why we put Mary so much bigger than Jesus? All right, so I just point this out that we have to look at both sides of this. And I, I think that that is uh, kind of confusing to people. After I gave, I've only given this, this is only the second time I've ever given this talk, by the way. I gave it one time last May. And afterwards, uh, some really nice people, who I don't know if she's here, I'm looking around, she might be, told me that I need to put this, this statue in the talk. And I love this statue. I'd never seen it before. But look at this depiction of Mary. And you can see how many different personalities you might conjure up in your mind for Mary as either a nurturer, maybe a gray-haired nurturer of you, or a vibrant, go get em young woman who's really to take on anything at any time, full of strength. And I think that just like we can imagine Jesus in different ways for us at different times, kind of like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Raymond Brown describes the Gospels as a diamond. The exegesis I quoted earlier, he says, you know, if you put a diamond down in the room and it twirls around on a string, every single person looking at it from a different angle sees something completely different because of the way light reflects off of that diamond. And that's the way Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are. And there's times in our life where we need to see one reflection of the gospel, and, and maybe it's a sorrowful, crying Jesus, you know, my Lord, my Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But there's other times where you need to see the kick-butt Jesus where he's taking on everybody and tearing up the temple. And I think a similar thing might benefit you and me in our relationship with Mary if we imagine her in different ways too. Okay? Sometimes lofted up by angels and sometimes just like this. So I decided that uh, that helped me. Taylor Ely, my daughter's, some of you know her, piano teacher for many years, wrote this to me. He's Catholic and he wrote, When I moved here 15 years ago, the first thing people would ask me we met was, Where do you go to church? When I would reply I was Catholic, they would ask me if I was Christian. You've all heard that before. <laughs> then they would just stare at me for a minute and go, oh, you guys are the ones who idolize and, and into idol and statue worship, right? Don't you pray to Mary or something? Needless to say, this kind of stuff drives me nuts. And uh, I just thought, I mean, that captures the whole thing. There's no reason to even comment anymore. But in this book, The True Devotion, there's multiple parts. And the second part is entitled, Pray to Jesus Through Mary. Now I'm entering into the heart of the talk. Pray to Jesus through Mary through Mary. That's what I didn't understand. So let's talk about that. Quotes directly from the book. Now I realize many people haven't read this book. Many of you may never read this book. So I've gone to great pains to figure out how in 45 minutes do I teach you a book that is this deep. So I've taken direct quotes out of there. I read this book three times to create the talk. And by the way, I didn't say this earlier, but I was petrified to create this talk. Somebody challenged me to create this talk over five years ago, and it sat around as an idea for four years until finally last spring I decided to take it on. So um, it's my best attempt at it. I know it's not good enough for her, but, uh, but that's why I read the book several times to try and get out what I think are the salient probably 10 to 12 quotes of the book. He wrote, 
There has been no other means given under heaven except the name of Jesus by which we can be saved. God has laid no other foundation for our salvation, our perfection, and our glory except Jesus Christ. Thank you, Louis de Montfort, for writing that. It's all about Christ. It's not about Mary. It's about Christ. And that's where people are getting confused. Okay? But Louis de Montfort makes this clear. And he says in here somewhere, you know, he's up here and she's way down here with us. We're below her in our faith journey, of course, but it's not as though we think she's divine. What she does for us, though, is something that no other person ever before or since can or will be able to do for us. And I'm getting to that. But it's not as though she is divine. This is the divine declaration that Louis de Montfort makes the most clear. Every building block which is not built upon that firm rock of Christ is founded upon the moving sand and sooner or later will fail infallibly. Then he writes, uh, in Revelations of Divine Mercy, St. Faustina writes, I desire, my dearly beloved daughter, that you should practice three, three yellow words, humility, purity, and love of God. That's what Mary said to Faustina. I want you to practice humility, purity, and love of God. Notice where she's turning St. Faustina's mind. She's putting St. Faustina on a direct visual path to God. Not on her, and not anywhere else. That's it. The, the essential point. Where is her gaze? Mary's gaze is on Christ. Most pleasing to me is the soul which faithfully carries out the will of God. Fix your gaze upon the passion of my son, and in this way you will be victorious. That's entry 449 from Revelations of Divine Mercy. Uh, <coughs> Miss Lang is here. Uh, she is the one who directed me to this book. When, when the girls were little, Brooke and Blair over there, you guys dressed up like saints one day. <laughs> At, the, at, at school, at Overbrook. And one of you was St. Faustina, and one of you was St. Teresa of Lisieux. And when I walked in that day, you asked me, what are they dressed like? What are the twins dressed like? And I said, I told you the answer. And you said, ah, revelations of divine mercy. That's what you said. And I had never read it. So I kind of was like, all right, well, I guess I better go get that one. And I did. And in revelations of divine mercy, the bolded sections are words directly spoken to her by Jesus, and the unbolded words are her reflections on those. And sometimes she's so deep in thought about everything that you think she's actually delirious. And plus, she was dying of tuberculosis, so I, as a physician, was wondering, is she hypoxemic? And maybe she's not thinking that clearly. But, uh, you know, and I, and I actually study delirium. That's my thing in terms of science. So I was really reading that, thinking I'm going to be pretty convinced here that she's delirious, and that's why she was seeing a baby Jesus on the altar and stuff. But the more you read it, you realize she's got clarity of thought, and these entries are just incredible. But she says, fix your gaze upon my son. So, when I was little, I read this book, Wrinkle of Time. Wrinkle of Time. Many of you know this. Did you know that Madeline Engel, by the way, was Catholic? And she writes some gorgeous, gorgeous poetry about Christ and God. And in fact, not too long ago, just a few months ago, they had a very beautiful poem in Magnificat by her. So she's way more than just a, a, a children's book writer. And anyway, I never forgot this fascination I had with wrinkling time. And she shows in there this thing where you, if an ant has to get from point A to point B, the ant has to walk across that path. Now, one thing is for sure, um, life is not even that, that easy going across that straight line. Our life really would have a squiggly line, right? And so, as I said earlier, the maze thing, you know, a proper maze, uh, our lives are these squiggly lines trying to get to Christ. If it was this good, we'd be happy, but it's not. But what Mary does for us is this. This is the visual I can gift to you. I didn't read this in a book anywhere. It just kept coming up in my brain. That what Mary does for us is take what is a squiggly line and not just create it as straight. She even goes beyond that. She tethers the line. She tethers the distance. And so essentially anything, can you get to Christ without Mary? Yes. Is it harder? Absolutely. Do you want the easiest path from point A to point B? Then go to Jesus through Mary because she will tether the distance. And whenever you focus on her and ask her in your heart to direct you towards Christ, she will make that distance not squiggly, 
not even straight. She'll make it immediate, rain on a pond, no distance, complete union, seventh mansion in the interior castle. That's, to me, what I have come to understand about Mary. Now, I'll keep unfolding the book for you, but now you basically know the punchline. And you're going to have to work through that on your own. Maybe this is, only works for me, but that's how I have come to visualize this. But it came clear to me only through reading this book. So, in perfect consecration to Jesus by Mary, Louis de Montfort writes things like this. See if this fits for you about what I just said. <clears throat> this devotion to the Blessed Virgin is a short road. A shorter road to find Jesus. Both because it is a road which we do not stray from, and because it is a road we treat with joy and facility. We make more progress, I love this quote, we make more progress in a brief period of submission to and dependence on Mary than in years of our own will and resting on ourselves. And this, I think, is where the Protestant Catholic disconnect occurs. They think, ah, why, that, that missionary to Russia that I told you about, where she said we got 100 conversions. She said to me afterwards, I didn't, I didn't include this part, why would you pray to Mary if you can go straight to Christ? The point is the distance of straight to Christ is shorter through Mary. And you're not praying to Mary, you're praying to Jesus through Mary. He then says, God reveals Mary the masterpiece of his hands as sure as the sure means of, and he says, the straight and immaculate way to Jesus Christ. The solid devotion to Our Lady is only to establish more perfectly the devotion to Christ and to put forward an easy and secure means for finding him. I'll just read the top part of this. What Lucifer lost by pride, Mary gained by humility. What Eve has damned and lost by disobedience, she saved by obedience. Straight line to Christ, avoiding tangents. I'll read the yellow part. No, I've got to read the top part. It's too good. <laughs> the most, I, I think about, about um, Mary squashing the head of, of the devil. The most terrible of all enemies God has set against the devil is his holy mother Mary. He has inspired her even since the days of earthly paradise, though she existed only in his idea. Now get this. It is not that the anger, the hatred, and the power of God are not infinitely greater than those of the Blessed Virgin. For the perfections of Mary are limited. She's, she's a person, not a God. But it is first because Satan, being proud, suffers infinitely more being beaten and punished by a little and humble handmaiden of God. That is a great point. How humiliating to Satan that Mary has that power over him. And that God put her in charge of humiliating him. And therefore, if we go to her, she will bring us avoidance of the temptation of sin. <clears throat> so, this is written to me by the father of a patient of mine. She was 21 years old, and she had leukemia at the ICU at Vanderbilt. I'm an ICU physician at Vanderbilt, and she died. We were not able to, uh, to work through God to have her saved. But on her death, I became very close with her parents, who live in Knoxville. And we got into the same conversations I got into with Maddie, the Pentecostal captain. And he writes things like this. The concept of praying to others even if I consider prestigious titles, sainthood, etc., that are not Holy Trinity really throws me. Where does that end? Pray to a deceased family member? If the idea is to help me, why would I petition them when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are there for me? I'm guessing that I'm not disrespecting Mother Mary by not praying to her, but that may be the case to my Heavenly Father if I do, not, if I do pray to someone else. So you can see how he goes on and on and on. I use that not to disrespect him or to judge him, of course, but to point out the reality of what goes in our minds and the minds of others who haven't developed a mature Marian devotion. Okay? And I, I, I think it's very understandable for people to wonder this stuff. And that's exactly what I wondered all those years. And then Louis de Montfort sets out the math of the book. So the math I'm going to take you through are true elements of devotion to Mary, and false elements of devotion to Mary. I'm going to lay these out for you, which is chapters in the book, but I'm going to just do it in a few slides. Okay? So five characteristics of a true devotion to Our Lady. Because even when you think you're being devoted to Our Lady, you could get way off target with this. All right? But I'm going to make the distinction for you according to Louis de Montfort. One, 
The first true devotion is interior. It has to come from the spirit and the heart. Two, tender, full of childlike confidence. Three, holy. It should, any devotion to Mary should lead the soul humbly and patiently to avoidance of sin. Four, it should remain constant. The person is neither changeable, irritable, scrupulous, timid. He, she may fall, but raises again and offering his, her hand to Mary to be lifted toward Jesus. In other words, I fall down. Mary, help me get back up towards that cross. Okay? And that's, those are the elements of, of the true devotion in, in conjunction with the folk, fact of disinterested. Inspired to seek God and not self. I don't need somebody to see me praying the rosary. I don't need somebody to see that I know all of the, I can recite by heart all of the, uh, you know, the aspects of the rosary and all the individual prayers that can go along with it, etc. Um, this is, that would be something that you are interested in others <laughs> seeing your holiness or something. So Mary would never lead you in that direction. That's you doing that and not her leading you to Christ. How would Mary devotion affect the soul? He says in part two of the book, what happens to you when you go to Jesus through Mary? Or, yeah, to Jesus through Mary. Understand your own evil better. Our Lady gives you a portion of her faith. She removes scruples and disordered fear. This is one worth extra focus. We act in fear all too often. What's happening with our children? Is my child going to stay Catholic? Is my child going to make an error in school? Am I going to fail at my job? Am I going to uh, cheat on my wife? Um, all the people in my family are divorced. You know, is that going to be my fate? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, she will remove that fear from you and make you realize that this irrational approach to wondering things is not healthy. It does not get you closer to Christ. And it is absolutely slapping God in the face because you are not depending upon Him and, and, and assuming the confidence and faith that He wants you to have. Her soul communicates to yours to glorify the Lord. She bears her fruit, Jesus Christ, in you, and she will give Jesus more glory in a month than otherwise in years. You will give Him more glory in a month than otherwise in years. My ad is you will understand the theology of the body in the Eucharist. I listened last year to all of Matthew West's tapes on theology of the body, Wow, how was I left out of that all my life? <laughs> I mean, uh, that was a game changer too. I mean, that wasn't even brought up when I was learning about Catholicism, theology of the body. And, and even years, decades after JP2 you know, told us about it and wrote about it, I never was taught anything about it. So uh, you should listen to Matthew West or others and read about theology of the body and understand this. It's, it's truly enlightening. So we have to then... Uh, Go towards true devotion to Mary and avoid false devotion. If, if devotion to Our Lady removed us from Jesus, we should have to reject it as an illusion of the devil. On the contrary, Lord, you are always with Mary, and Mary always with you, and she cannot be without you, else she would cease to be what she is. She is so transformed into you by grace that she lives no more. It is you only, my Jesus, who lives and reigns in her more perfectly than in all the angels. That's him talking about Mary. For she is not like the rest of creatures. Now this is a pivotal point. She is not like the rest of creatures. Why is it that she can get us to Christ when others, all of us in this room, can't do the same thing? So here's the distinction. If other creatures who, if we attached ourselves to them, might rather draw us away from God, the strongest inclination of Mary is to unite us to Jesus, and the strongest inclination of her son is that we should come to him by his holy mother. This honors him as it would a king for us to become the slave of his queen. So unfortunately, I can't do for my wife what Mary can do. Even though I'm a person and she's a person, you're, she's lost, my wife lost, if she goes with me to bring her there as, as she needs to devote herself to Mary uh, otherwise. Now, hopefully she and I will help each other along the way, but the truth is that we will let each other down too. So now we have to focus on what would be the false devotions, the sermon of the false devotions. Critical devotees are false, devotee, false devotions. Those are proud scholars, self-sufficient, they criticize things. Scrupulous devotees fear to dishonor the son by honoring the mother. It doesn't make sense if you actually go towards the true devotions. External devotees, all devotions, outward practices, rosaries, surfaces. Presumptuous, sinners abandoned to passions under the pretext that they are devout to Mary, presuming that God will pardon them. 
in, in constant devotees, hypocritical devotees, interested devotees. I, this is the part of the book that I can't summarize in one slide. This is about 20 or 30 pages in this book. It's way too much. I just wanted to point out to you that it is outlined in this book what are the false devotions to Mary, and they are perilous. If we go down those roads, we are way off track. And, and I understand why that gives people questions and qualms about Catholic's devotion to Mary. I'm very close to the end of the talk. <laughs> no, you're relieved. And I'll take some questions at that point. I just don't want you to think I'm going to go on forever. I've got maybe five more slides up. I read this book last year by Dolan, who's now a cardinal. You know, he was Archbishop Dolan. Uh, this, in the book, To Whom Shall We Go, which is Ad Quim Ibimus in, in Latin. This I recommend as a book. It's extremely simple. It's only this thick. You can go to Amazon and get it. To Whom Shall We Go? It's very, very practical about our faith. I was so thankful that I found this book. But anyway, at the end of the book, Dolan gives nine tips for a closer relationship to Christ. And his third one is great. The other eight are great too. But look at this one. Take an interest in his family, just like you would any human, and ask him about his mother, our mother, your mother Mary. She will take you to him, and he will take you back to her. When you're praying to Christ, ask him, how's your mom doing? How's Mother Mary doing? Develop that personal relationship with her and with him. And he will take you to her and she will take you back to him. And I've written a little bit about that in this handout that's up here. Some of you got it. There are two handouts up here. You can pick them up on your way out. One of them is specifically regarding this talk and something that I chose out of the preface of the talk. That's one of the sheets of paper. Each of them is one sheet of paper front and back. The other one is actually a very personal recount of a four-day silent Ignatius space retreat that I did down in Manresa where I realized I completely misunderstood the sixth commandment. And I kept thinking that, it was, that the commandments were don't do this, don't do that. And this Jesuit down there wrote what the commandments were and the sixth commandment had no no in there. There was no not. And he flipped the commandment completely on its head and made me understand how poorly I had upheld the sixth commandment uh, for my wife, Kim. And so I, I wrote about that, and that's the other one. It was in the Catholic Register, so it's been published before, that sort of thing. But anyway, um, take an interest in Mary, Jesus' mother. And uh, lastly, Carol Hauslander writes, Do you find help from the rosary? I find just holding on to it even helps. Some would say it's mere superstition, but it isn't if it symbolizes holding on to God, as it does for me. I knew a very ill girl whom no one could diagnose or cure. Also to her, God was a vague idea, and her only reaction to God was fear and aversion. I gave her a rosary and told her to try to say something with it in her hand, her own prayer, whatever, or say nothing, but mean to hold on to God. From the hour she took the rosary in her hand, she has been better and now is almost cured. Her mind has flowered too, literally changing from a narrow, self-obsessed mind to a big, objective, clever, and loving one. That's Mary tethering the distance. There's no other explanation for that. So here she is in the Pietà. You look at her face and imagine what she just went through. She's got blood all over her. He's got blood all over him. He's blue totally cyanotic, no life in it. That's her son that was killed in front of her. And she has no anger on her face. None. Look at her face. There's no anger. There's acceptance. There's peace. There's sadness, maybe. But in your Pieta moments in life, in those moments of life where you don't know why, you can look to Mary, and she will take you to him, and he will take you back to her. This Pieta is a magical thing for you if you use it and harness the power of it when you're confused and don't understand. What were Mary's last recorded words? Her last commandment. We went over who the first Christian was. We went over what her first words were. Why? But why with confidence? At the wedding Cana, she said to her son, what, her son said, what business is it of mine, woman? She replied, do whatever he tells you. 
and no more words were ever recorded of her, nor would any others be necessary. With this question, Jesus sought her permission to start his ministry, not being rude, asking her permission, which she granted. Another example of how available our roadmap is in the Bible. You don't need anything more than that. She told you, just like she told him, do whatever he tells you. She takes you to him. Totus Tuus, which many of you go to in town, you know it's the group for the boys held in cathedral, actually came from Louis de Montfort. It means all of yours. JP2 got this from that Latin phrase right there. Totus Tuus, Ango Sum et Omnia Mea Tuus Sum. I am all yours, and all I have is yours. I welcome you into all my affairs and concerns. Show me your heart, O Mary. Totus Tuus. Ad quivum quim ibimus. Never be afraid of loving the Blessed Virgin too much. You can never love her more than Jesus did. Maximilian Kolbe. Let's end in a prayer together then. Read with me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mother of God, most holy Mary, my mother, you are my mother in a special way now, because I am the love of the Son, my bridegroom. And thus we are both your children. For your son's sake, you have to love me. O Mary, my dearest mother, guide my spiritual life in such a way that it will please your son. about a quarter after. I held it to 45 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them, or maybe perhaps uh, any comments or teaching me some of the things I might have missed would be welcome. And don't be bashful. It's time for us to share with one another. Sister.